World Financial Group offers entrepreneurs from all backgrounds the opportunity to start their own business on a level playing field. Dr. Yana Woodhouse, receiving the WCM Wall Street Pioneer Award by the United Black Wall Street of America, Inc., is one of those entrepreneurs. I see WFG and TFA as a place where African Americans with an entrepreneurial mindset can flourish. And the bonus, we help families and serve the communities across the country. To learn more about us, go to worldfinancialgroup.com. We are the sons and daughters of the soul. We are resilient and forever forward thinking. We ask for nothing else than the opportunity to live and to create the lives that we were meant to live. We want nothing but an equal chance at options and possibilities. The same possibilities and options to live out our potential as our fellow man. We want to be heard, understood, and expressive in our reality. We are the teacher. We are the creator. We are here. and you're listening to Urbanology with This is Kia Rogers and you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. Good afternoon. This is Tony Rogers, your host for Urbanology, the Art of War. Hope all is well. It's um, been a, kind of interesting as far as weather. You know, one day is freezing, the other day is warm. You have to uh, make sure you listen very closely to the weather predictions to know how to dress. And even then, you get caught short. But nevertheless, I always tell people getting up is the most important thing that you can do to begin your day, and you should show a great deal of gratitude for, for doing that. And um, nothing is promised. I uh, have uh, scheduled uh, a good friend today, uh, James Smalls, James uh, Professor James Smalls has been uh, a friend for many years, uh, going back to our days at the City College of New York. Matter of fact, uh, uh, when I came to City College for the first time, I grew up in that community. I grew up uh, on Convent Avenue. Uh, uh, three blocks from, from City College, actually across the street at one point. Uh, City College stretches from 131st Street all the way to 141st Street on Convent Avenue. But uh, it had always been kind of like a, a place when I uh, grew up, looking out my window, I would see the green grass and all of the the uh, students studying and 
playing at that time. They had frisbees and all of that stuff. I I remember asking my mom, uh, "What's that? <laughs> what, what, what am I looking at here? It looks like a, a nice place, you know." Uh, and she says, "Well, that's a college. That's City College over there. Those are students." And uh, I, I always remember her telling me the story that I asked her that did uh, black people go to college? Because I didn't see any people of color there at that time. And it, it was always a, a place where I looked upon as being uh, a place that I felt that I wanted to be because it just, you know, just looked like some place that would be of interest uh, for a young kid who, you know, had not experienced a lot of uh, a college life at that particular point uh, in Harlem. Uh, so City College has always been a part of my life. Uh, Lewisham Stadium, a lot of people may not know that um, where we call the Knack Building now, used to be a place called Lewiston, Lewiston Stadium. And that's where Lincoln Center, actually, the one that we go downtown to see uh, in Lincoln Center, it was really all of the performances that would take place uh, uh, in relationship to the Lincoln Center uh, uh, productions in the summer would take place uh, at City College, the Lewiston Stadium. It was the uh, Metropolitan Opera House that did a lot of that, Sir Rudolph Bain. Uh, and he was able to produce so many interesting shows uh, a couple of <laughs> blocks away from where we would play and we would see all of these people coming in, you know, all these white people coming in with blankets and all of that stuff. And of course, that was interesting. And then, you know, to go up and hear whether it was opera, whether it was jazz, whether it was the Gershwin's, where it was Louis Armstrong, where it was uh, uh, so many uh, uh, wonderful historic figures weren't that aware of it. What we were aware of is that when there was nothing going on in Lewisham Stadium, we used to sneak in there and 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 and, and find out how to uh, play. So when these concerts was going on, we used to sneak in and, and play. And that's another story, how we actually my first job with Rudolph Bain said, well, I know you guys are getting in here, but if you want to work, you can work there. And that was my beginning experience again as for City College. My 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 guess when I came out of the service, I joined the Panther Party, which was an interesting story in the devil. So and we used to come to City College to sell uh the papers. And the brother who I'm going to introduce said, You can't do that on campus here. And I was trying to figure out how. It, at that time, we were really um, into this Marxist thing, the power to the people, and you know how, and 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 kind of anti-nationalistic, which is interesting because uh, I'm now part of the Pan-African movement. But how I get became introduced to all of that stuff was when I finally came to City College. I ran into again uh, James Smalls, who, who is a student there, and I remember he was the one that. We used to argue about why I couldn't sell papers there. And, and we became friends. He introduced me to Dr. Lynn Jeffries, the Black Studies Department. And uh, I had I was going to law school, Black Pre-Law Society, and a number of those entities. So it was James Smalls who kind of brought me into an understanding, not only of who I was, I was studying philosophy then and introducing me to a number of people who became legendary. And um, long story short, Professor Smalls went his way, I went mine. 
but we always remain connected. Of course, I spent some time with City College advisor for about four or five presidents, and and James went around the world. He and Dr. Jeffries, he speaks all around the world um, about Pan Africa. And I'm going to Senegal in a couple of days, and uh, it was I, I called him. He was in my meditation. So I said, "Call James," and I. We had a wonderful conversation. So much so that I said, "James, I'd like for you to be a guest on my show to talk about some of the things that you're doing now." So I would like for you to meet a, a wonderful brother. You know, uh, we've been together for a long time. Well, over 40 years, Professor James Smalls. How are you doing, Brother Tony? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. I I I, I saw that I was kind of dancing around, and then I saw that you came on. I knew that you was doing some things. I was doing like yeah. Sandman, you know, after you, you know, waiting for the people to come out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was with our sister Susan Tata out of Cameroon uh -huh. on Pan African Daily TV. And so, wow. which is a platform. You're looking good, man. I'm just yeah, trying to stay good. healthy. I told you I went back to the dojo. Working yeah, with yeah. Mahalia, huh? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Mahalia was on the show not long ago. Yeah. And that, it was like that's the 52 that blocks, right? Huh? The 52, 52 blocks. 52 blocks, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm all over the world. And at this age, I got to be able to end situations quickly. You know? <laughs> and, don't uh, have that much time the way we used to, right? Right. <laughs> You can't play around anymore, you know. She's like, you be dancing, you, no, no, you got to make it. Take I care of you, Doctor J, Mahilia. We was the train up at the college. For, yes, for yes. Starting in the old Finley Center way back in the day. Yeah. Yes. No, we have but a listen, long history. Um, you know, I, our history go almost fifty years, Tony. Yeah, you know, I, I was just, I was just getting ready to say. Mm -hmm. um, I knew you and 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 Carol, who uh, is was at City College too. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, studying medicine and you know putting up with James. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and then I, I saw all of the children. You know, mm -hmm. as they were little. I mean, I run into them now, but I would not know them. But you know, you have been family for a long time, and we've been closer to some family, <laughs> you know. Yeah, as we, we've that. actually, you know, we've been out here in the struggle, and the struggle, you become family. You know, a lot of people don't realize, and we were out here in the 60s, because I think we met in 69. We were out here in the 60s. Most people were afraid to do the things we were doing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> people were like, they didn't want to have nothing to do with people like us. We were fighting the best way we knew how to fight uh, to bring change to the black community. Um, and um, City College at that time, you know, with you, Dr. J, I mean, it was so, I mean, there were sessions there where everybody that you can think about, Dr. I mean, would come up and, and, and talk and educate people uh, about who they were. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 can never thank you enough for saying, Tony, you know, you go to all of these other pre-law meetings, you need to come up here mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and see why, you, why, 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 why do you think you studied philosophy? And what was that in your head? Why did you think that that was a course that you seemed to like when you, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, when I went back to school, philosophy, I'm saying, I got that. I understand that. I didn't know why. Mm. <laughs> and then going up there, uh, re realizing, hey, because it all came out of Kemet. <laughs> yeah. And and our ancestors have always been with us and they've always tried to call us. And they've given us multiple pathways to go. Uh, the work that you did in Harlem and working with Brother Lloyd and, 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 and other figures of note in the Harlem community politically, the Basil Pattersons, the Carl McCall, the Percy. Tally Rango, the, I mean, um, people don't understand that had it not been for the stability that you guys brought, we'd have lost Harlem a long time ago. Um, and, and 
today, even though it, it may seem like gentrification is winning out, but it's not. You know, sometimes you can tell yourself something long enough you believe the, the illusion. Yes, it happened in many areas, but Harlem is still strongly a black Harlem, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, it's um, the cultural component of it is 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 where I think no one can ever change that. Right. I wanted to spend some time, though, because I, I don't think I have to tell people about uh, you and what you've done, what Dr. Jeffries has done. They've seen you on TV. They've heard your lectures. They know what you're about. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting because another brother that I was in the Panther Party with, uh, Jamal Joseph, as you know, who uh, mm -hmm. is another person who has, you know, done so much. Yes. I found that both of you, in some form of fashion, was working on this uh, project, The Godfather of Harlem, as consultants and some other components. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there has been a lot of controversy about whether that was true or the things that was happening was true or you know what's happening. But then well, when I knew that you were attached to it in some kind of way, it allowed for me to say, well, I know that <laughs> something there <laughs> has to have a, a certain type of a calling if, if James is doing it. Tell us a little bit about how you got connected with it and what your ideas and concepts is and will be because I think a new right. series is coming out in January. Yes. Well, I got involved because one of my sons, the one you met at Kanatan, uh -huh. um, went to school with a young man named Marcon Smith. I think uh -huh. they, they went to, to Hampton together. And Marcon Smith was a very close friend of Bumpy Johnson's granddaughter, Margaret, who still lived in the Lennox Terrace where her grandfather used to live. And she had written a script after Hoodlum came out. She said, that's not the story of my father. So she wrote a script of her own and Mark was trying to shop that script. And so he had a meeting coming up with someone from AB, some people from ABC, Disney. And he asked my son about if my son could help him hook up a historian that knew Harlem. And so he had another person, my son said, no, you need to talk to my daddy. So Marcon called me and we went to the meeting at Sylvia's um, and we met with the, the showrunner and chief writer for ABC, uh, Chris Brancato and a brother, Paul Epstein um, and a brother, Jim, um, what's Jim's name? Uh, he's out of LA and an, another Asian sister who worked for ABC. And we kicked it with the script that Margaret, that Bumpy's daughter wrote. That's where the Godfather emanates from. And so the um, they didn't want to do another just gangster story. They said, we've done a bunch of gangster stories. We can't outdo Hoodlum, which was a pretty good story. And remember, it's a story, it's not the mm -hmm. truth. And so I suggest we tell a Harlem story with, about a gangster. And he said, well, how do you do that? I said, okay. In telling the story of Harlem, let's look at some of the other players. You know, and I named many of them. Um, uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, Malcolm X, um, uh, Carlos Cook. I even named a Lumbe <laughs> Pratt. And I said, there's all these people I named, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben. I said, these are all people who are shaping the culture of Harlem that Bumpy is living in, right? And I named some other business persons. So they thought that was intriguing, that we could do a story that involved these other people. And so before we left the table, we came up with the theme, when the Harlem underworld meets the civil rights movement. That's the theme of the program. Mm -hmm. When the Harlem underworld meets the civil rights movement. And you notice throughout the, the series, we've made sure we've covered the, the, the civil rights bill being signed. We've covered the voter registration bill being signed. 
when Smyrna Goodwin and the other young man was, was murdered, we had that as a part of the series because, and people ask, was that the truth? Yes, the mafia did send people, okay, to uh, Mississippi. And they did extract some help from the Klan. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Remember, that's how they end up finding the boy's body. Mm -hmm. That was partially true. We didn't have all of the detail. Of course, you have to create your fiction around it. But that did happen. And Bumpy had something to do with that. See, the numbers racket didn't end in New York. The numbers racket went all down to Gainesville, Florida, all down to South Carolina, you know, and, and but New York was the headquarters. So there was a black network up and down the East Coast. You had a black organized criminal network in Philly, in, in, in Newark, in Chicago, in Detroit. And these people had a relationship. So we wanted to show that. And so, because most of the times we think that we're just the one incidental person. Now, Mr. Johnson happened to be from my family's hometown, Charleston, South Carolina. So I had a special interest in him and I was always very fond of him in the little book that I found when I first came to New York about him. So I said, how do we tell his story? And especially when we found out from Margaret, his daughter, that him and Malcolm X played chess almost every Sunday, that these people were really good friends and brothers. And I know it for a fact because when Malcolm, you know, gets killed, I take over the Muslim mosque, Inc., his new mosque. I'm 21 years old. And it was Bumpy Johnson people who was protecting me. The same one of the men who you know, Sunni Malik, mm -hmm. who was protecting Malcolm. Right. And so and so Sunni knew me the streets, because I didn't know nothing but the streets of Harlem, you know. Mm -hmm. But Sunni Malik and Sunny Carson gave me a real <laughs> growing up fast uh training. And so I wanted to try to tell, I even wanted Sunni Malik in there, you know, because he was my man. But that was going a little far, but he's one of those men that's Bumpy's um, security in the movie. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get somebody that looked like Sunni, but we got somebody who played that role of Sunni, you right. know, Trigger Man. Um, and so we wanted to tell a story of Harlem. When Bumpy goes to prison that last time, even though he had a, an agreement with Lucky Luciano, that Harlem would be left alone. Luciano dies and the other mafia feel, we don't have to honor that agreement. Bumpy went to prison and took a fall for the La Cosa Nostra. And yet he was double crossed while he was in prison and they moved into Harlem with the drugs. So when he comes home, his thing is, I've got to take Harlem back. So that's what the movie is really about. Him fighting to take Harlem back from the white mafia. But the white mafia has now introduced heroin at a high level. Heroin was always there, but it was at a low level. Now it's become a big deal. So he has to take control of the drug traffic from them to take Harlem back. And that's what you see the war is about. And, and, and the other thing that, because I'm the chief consultant for the entire project, right? And my thing was, we don't have to, Always we see the black gangs that get killed. We never see the other side. They're like, we got to kill as many of them as they kill of us, <laughs> you know? Which happened. Kind of crazy, but the psychology of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so people got upset about that one, right? And then in Malcolm's role, I took the liberty. I wanted the messenger because I wanted to show the nation of Islam as liberators and not as killers of Malcolm, right? Um, and now it's hard to do, given everything that's in the, you know, the contemporary historical motif right now with a nation. You can't blame a whole organization for what a few people did, but we've done that because of the way we've been orientated. So I wanted to show the messenger in a powerful way. But remember, I'm fighting against a bunch of other forces now. I'm not just saying, Brother Small, want to do this and it's going to happen. We are having literal wars with scripts, but all the script came to me once it's written, and I would critique it and go back and forth, especially on the roles of Malcolm and the role of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, and as well as on the role of Bumpy, because I, I really requested that we give him a family, not just a, a, a woman of the night that he's hanging with in the clubs, but he have a wife and children. And so that was agreed upon. And um, so we, um, got a, 
a beautiful Ethiopian sister of Finesh, who was born and raised in Harlem to play his wife, you know. And then we found just some extraordinary actresses who played the daughters and to play Sister Betty and, and to give Sister Betty more of a role than just honorable mention, but to see her and Malcolm embracing each other and kissing, being lovers, husband and wife, and being family. And to have Bumpy come home to a dinner um, at a table and have discussions with his wife and show all of those things was what some of us pushed for and certainly I pushed for. Because we wanted to show that yes, there was such a man as Bumpy Johnson, just like we had Frank Lupus and we had um, um, what's the, our, our other brother's name who was um, or was big in the drug market right after Bumpy died, they became big. Um, but we wanted Nikki to show Barnes? Was, uh, Nikki, Nikki Barnes, Barnes. Mm -hmm. you know, and I told you before I worked work with Nikki, we had a deal where mm -hmm. he made City College a drug free zone as long as the Muslim mosque and the oil you didn't mess with him in Harlem. I had to cut that deal. <laughs> All right, no drugs on City College. And the couple of guys that were selling a city, we turned them over to Nikki's people, and that, that was that was the sell, and they didn't come back there no more. And so even to the point that was so known by the system that it, they accused me of using drug money to give scholarship to black kids. And my retort was, that's a good way to spend the money, you know, even though that wasn't what I was doing. But the movie, Godfather of Harlem, and then we showed Adam Powell, I thought in the first showing that they didn't get Powell right. And so we came up with a documentary called By Whatever Means Necessary to yeah. kind of do an expose on the strength of uh, Adam Powell. And in episode two, we did better. And three, he's going to really shine. Now, I saw the first, there, there are going to be three episodes of whatever means necessary? Uh, no. And, 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 oh, oh, and the, the, oh, oh, the, the, oh, the Godfather. Okay. Yeah. And, and episode three, you're going to really see Adam shine. That's in, in, Jan that's in January. January 15th. Uh -huh. it's, it'll, it'll debut. Um, so, so it's... And I know Jamal is in uh, uh, whatever means necessary. I think that's on Netflix. Yes, okay. and and on Hulu, uh, as well as Hulu. Epic. I think Epic just got well. Epic is a, um, a is the television expression of MGM. Uh -huh. So that's who put up the money, right. and then ABC Disney uh -huh. put up the technology and you know the 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 the, the, the workers. Um, James, just um, we're going to come back to this, but I, I wanted to make sure that I got <laughs> some, some some time in. You and Dr. Jeffries have been going to Africa for a long period of time. I remember you uh, in our conversation said that you were looking to start doing some things. As you know, I'm working on uh, the Awakening of the Sleeping Giant Project, which is trying to get more African and Caribbean Americans back there. But what are some of the things you were doing and, and and hopefully we can work together on some of the things that you're planning to do in the future in Senegal and Ghana? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in Ghana, 17 years ago, 18 years now, we bought a hotel, Sana Lodge, which we still own. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 room hotel, swimming full size, swimming pool, pool bar, cocktail lounge, full restaurant and conference center. And what part of Ghana is that? In? Cape Coast. And it's called Sana Lodge. S -A Spell that. S A N A A. S A N A A. A A Lodge. Lodge. And that's where. Yeah. And um, it's in Cape Coast, Ghana. Ghana. C A P Cape Coast. C A P E, C O A S T. Uh -huh. And we're operating, it's open right now. Um, I was the CEO of the project. Well, we have two corporations in Ghana, the Sana right. Launchings Enterprise Limited and the African-American Management Company, Ghana Limited. Right. And I've headed both of those companies. We also opened a, a credit union there in Cape right. Coast um, because there's a lot of African diasporans there. Um, and we have another, you know, we, we spearheaded the Hotel Layers Association, because they had no um, organized union body to speak the government. Right. So we organized the Hotel Layers Association 
of course, we got the first awards, but it wasn't fixed. <laughs> you know. Have you ever started looking at doing similar things in Senegal? Because that's kind of like what mm -hmm. I I have started to do. It's <laughs> it's been a uh, it's like I uh, feel like I'm on a rodeo in a buck. <laughs> you know. I'm, yeah. No, though yeah. we you know we had worked closely with Senegal in the early years of the. 70s and 80s. And then we lost our major airlines. We lost Ghana Airways and we yeah. lost Air Afrique. And that almost cut us off from Senegal because now the airline was dominated by Delta. And um, then the smaller airline, it was almost as costly to fly from Ghana to Senegal as it was to fly from America to Ghana, which may seem crazy, mm. but that's what was happening. I think since United got back in the game, that has changed the game quite a bit. And then now you tell me Senegal Air is Air, Air Senegal flies Air direct Senegal. from JFK to Okay. But so that's to really Ghana. gonna has been a game changer, I suppose, in terms of us being able to move. So I'd like to work with you on a on the project in Senegal. Yeah, because that's really what kind of initiated this kind of conversation, even though Mm -hmm. uh, the conversation sound good, but I'm the only one doing coup de kente, doing all the work, you know. You know, oh, but, I know how that one works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know you do. It's, it, but what's happening, James, is even though it's been extremely difficult, uh, even up until before I got on the phone, I'm, you know, everything, my itinerary has completely changed and all of that stuff is, is happening. And I, and I have to figure out how I'm going to, you know, you know, work with that. But the outcome of it is that I do believe that there's some, something greater than myself Absolutely. involved in doing this because, uh, as I was saying, I, I was, um, dealing with all of this stuff in meditations, trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to do this now? You know, fortunately, I have a base there. I have uh, some people who live there mm -hmm. who can do a lot of the stuff that I, you know, I can't do when WhatsApp is not happening. But still, you know, it's, you know, they're not getting paid. They're working. I'm, you know, leaning on their relationship to help me put a lot of this mm -hmm. together. But I was in my meditation. I've said to myself, "How am I going to do this?" And you came up. <laughs> you, came, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it, you know. For some reason, and I, and I'm not sure how it came about, but you came into that that mindset, and I called you because yeah, you did a spiritual I thing. In your I always believe that uh, when you come. Dreams, you know about this, you guys. I mean, we've been oh, talking about this for a long period of time, more so than I, uh, because you and Dr. J and, and many of the colleagues that you run with have been uh, well aware of some of the things that I know, but have not really taken as time as I am now to really see it. But the bottom line is that when you get messages, you begin to follow that path because even though it seems difficult, <laughs> things happen. So I called. I said, hey, look, I'm, I'm at this crisis. Let me call James. Not even to connect at that point. Mm -hmm. It was only when we started talking that it started to come to me. I said, Damn, that's right. You know, you're doing these things. So I, 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 I believe that there is something there. And I was asking about Ghana because I have a, 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 a Zoom meeting tomorrow with uh, uh, Angelo Parker. He's the head of the Northern Region Tourism Component, mm -hmm. wanting to look at doing some, some some things with Harlem. You know, everybody is starting to look at Harlem the mm -hmm. way we've always looked at it, you know, mm -hmm. and I guess it's because more than us are coming to Harlem, so, right. so you know how that goes. You know, I remember Dr. Jeffries uh, talked about uh, the book uh, I forget the name of it, uh, 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 but um, it was a, 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 a European author. Uh, but he said, 
you know this is true because the white boy wrote it, but it's yeah. good information. <laughs> but they go yeah. really say it's true, but we're going to use it because he's telling the truth. <laughs> you know? But um, tell us, uh, James, about some of the things that you're, you're besides uh, uh, your lecturing, what are some of the things you're working on or planning to work on? Well, with the you know with the with the hotel in Ghana, we're, we're still working with that project and the credit union, but we're also, you know, we have a travel uh, agency that we've um, for forty years, Cultural Heritage African Tours. Uh -huh. We started out at City College as the African Pilgrimage Project, <laughs> and, okay. and then we took it from the African Pilgrimage Project to Cultural Heritage African Tours. Uh -huh. Well, we've been to Ethiopia, we've been to Egypt, we've been to Senegal, we've been to Benin, Togo, Ghana, um, Uganda. And so this year we we are contemplating, do we do, and I've got to make this decision in the next few days, do we do Egypt, Ghana, or just Ghana this year? We wanted to do... Um, you mean next year, Ghana in 2023? Next, next year. We wanted to do um, Sierra Leone, Senegal. Uh -huh. That was a big package we were looking at. So that's something you and I can talk about. Um, and the reason Sierra Leone, Senegal, is because Sierra Leone is where my um, my achondria family is from. My great grandmother came from Sierra Leone. Uh -huh. So I'm a Mendy on grandma, great grandma Hope's side. Um, so I wanted, I've never been to Sierra Leone, though, but I need to go to her home. Right. And so this was going to be the year I was going to do that. Um, well, you know, in 2023, I I would like to um, partner with you uh, in something dealing with Ghana because that's what we're talking about at this particular point. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you had mentioned that, and I completely forgot about the hotel. I remember when all of that was happening, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it it allows for some other types of conversations that. At some point, when I start to talk with uh, the, he's a new person who's charge of the is the, the the northern region, which I'm not. Mm -hmm. You probably know better than what that means than than, than me. But uh, and we may even look at doing a, a fan trip sometime in, in 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 March. But at any rate, that that that's something that. Uh, I, I I think that I would love to to kind of do some yeah. things with you yeah. and, and whatever you're doing in Senegal. We're looking yeah, to go to my Ghana again, trip. Right? Huh? My Ghana trip involves going to the northern region. You know, uh -huh. we were one of the few groups that went to the northern region. The northern region is majority Muslim. It's okay. The Muslim region. It has a small Catholic enclave in a few places, but it's primarily a Muslim uh, region. And the reason I started going there, maybe 30 years ago, we started going up there um, to Wa, Bogotanga, Paga, Salaga, uh, is because um, many of our people did not come from coastal Ghana. We came from northern Ghana. Mm. And one of the Ghanaian linguists, elder historians, when we were going there and going to Kamasi and Kokra, he said, look, this is all cool, but this is where your people come from. <laughs> your people come from up north and mm -hmm. was captured and brought down here. And so you need to go up there. And so we started going up there. And indeed, you'll see that um, a lot of those people look just like a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. A, lot of, a lot of those people in the northern sector um, are the people from the refugee population that left um, what is now called Israel when the Hebrew, the black Hebrews were run out. Um, a lot of those people are the people who were um, left Egypt when the Romans and the Greeks and then the Turks and all the different ones, as they invaded, we do what any refugee population do, we scatter back to our ancestral lands. Mm -hmm. So you find that a lot of those populations that make up our population over here came from the East Africa sector mm. over to the West Africa sector. And you'll find a lot of those ethnic nations in the northern part of Ghana. And today they're mostly Muslim. That's mostly interesting. And, 
and and that's kind of like what I'm experiencing. The stuff that is happening seems to be. If I write this thing down, it would seem like it was like a, a, a novel <laughs> as to how in the last two years, all of this stuff has been going on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a, an interesting, and it's still going on uh, as it relates to this trip that's happening. We're going to Senegal again in, in May mm -hmm. for around the Jazz Festival in St. Louis. So we need to sit down at some point soon. We'll talk after the show and let's see how we can collaborate. Yeah, that'd be great, especially the one in May because uh, I'm talking to a, a number of people, um, Leon Mobley, who's a percussionist, who mm -hmm. is, is interested in it. A couple of people, because when we were there uh, in March, we met with a number of the coordinators for the festival and their whole thing is that we would love to try to develop some connections with U.S., you know, you know, Harlem, you know, the America to get some of the talent there because a lot of their talent comes from France. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why a lot of people here are not aware of the Senegalese uh, Jazz Festival because it's not yeah. promoted based on there are not a lot of American Randy um, Weston West. was trying to tr change that in 2019 before he, 2018 before he passed. He was trying to become, as they it would say, Americanize it in a sense, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so that's another thing that that that's happening that we're looking to, and with your help, to begin to look at how to begin to do those things because, at least the groundwork in Senegal. You know, it's theirs now. It's just putting an infrastructure around it and connecting with, you know, the knowledge that you have and the people that that we we, we all know to see how that might be able to work. You're doing a lot of lectures. I see you, you uh, on a lot of the tapes. Um, uh, what are some of those things? What are you What are you doing now? Where can people hear some of? I mean, I I see you all over. James, you know, you know I'm great. proud to know that you're my brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell, I've gotten tell very quiet you. through the years because you know you're getting older. And then somebody about four years ago took uh, three minutes out of a hour and a half lecture I did on 125th Street. They took three minutes of me criticizing continental Africans and sent that all over Africa. Now I don't know who did it. I could kind of guess who did it, you know. So I said, oh, y'all want to challenge me on the media? So I went buck wild. I was on every African platform I could get on for three years, just inundated them with knowledge and information to refute them taking that three minutes of a critique. I was having with the merchants on 125th Street trying to get them to unite as one to mm -hmm. fight against the police taking their products and throwing it in the garbage, <laughs> you know? And because I have a vendor's license, but you're only supposed to be able to get a vendor's license if you are a veteran at many years mm -hmm. ago. And so many of the young brothers can't get a license. But when I go down to the vet, the agency that gives the license, every other ethnic group is down there being given licenses. And they're not veterans, except the African-American population. And so I took that on in a struggle around 125th Street. So they took this little critique, but I'm just trying to embarrass these brothers to unite with the African-American brothers. And so I just, once I got out there, I realized so many people did not know their history. It was like we were back in the 60s. <laughs> so I just went on to try to teach and working with Susan Tata on Pan-African Daily TV on certain platforms in Ghana and Senegal and the Caribbean and over here, especially with a lot of the young guys and I looked up one day and there was a hundred lectures of mine on YouTube. <laughs> I don't even remember when I did them, you know. And I, and, you know, I mean, even with Hidden Colors, that, that right. Was, That's it, I with think it was on the last yeah. Yeah, yeah part of that one. And, and there's yeah. another series that just came out that I really love, a beautiful piece. It's called Heavy is the Crown. So check that Heavy out. Heavy is the Crown? Heavy is the Crown. And where, where can you get that? Where is that? It's, you can go to YouTube. 
uh-huh. and and you'll see how you can get it. You uh-huh. you can watch it on YouTube or you can download. Uh, it's, it's three parts, very powerful. Myself heavy as a crown, C R O W. Heavy, yeah, as the C R O W N, the crown. Heavy is the crown we wear, so we say heavy is the crown. Um, and I think you like some of that, you know, dealing with history, dealing with spirituality, particularly. And I've done some stuff I'm on Prince Hall Masonry. You know, I'm a Prince Hall Mason, Cornerstone uh-huh. 37, um, part of the, the, the Harlem Grand Lodge. And so I lecture on Masonry um, to a lot of the young Masons around the country to try to get them to be more responsible to the community as uh-huh. Masons. You know, all the older boys, they weren't too happy with it at first, but then they realized, oh, people are joining us, so we better support small. You know? uh, <laughs> So doing this just to get the young people to understand that masonry is a very powerful institution. It's one of our probably most powerful institution, even though it has to operate virtually in a secret methodology. It did it behind the church and came through the church. So many people thought it was the church, but many times it was masonry manifesting through the church. I have and, to talk to you about that because uh, I, uh, my, my, my father tried his best. You know, mm-hmm. this is when I was, you know, heavy into the, the Panthers to mm-hmm. allow for me to understand all of the stuff that you're doing, you need to be more focused. Hope R. Stevens tried to 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 get me into understanding it. And I always thought uh, well we'll have to talk about certain yeah. things. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about that one. But it's a powerful institution in our community, and we really need to learn it and support it. Um, Prince Hall has a most fantastic history, but we don't know the history. Um, well, I mean, and I support it. Matter of fact, most of the, a lot of the stuff comes from ancient Kemet. You know, all of the right. you know a lot of the, right. and studying a lot of that. I, I I kind of understand much of it, but I have to talk to you because uh, again. I, uh, I I was looking. I always carry my dad's oils because he said always keep that and remind me of you. Mm-hmm. And and it's here, you know. And well, they're just different things that has connected me. But I never really put a lot of uh, emphasis on it, only because of some of the other history mm-hmm. you know, of, of 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 that type of uh connection i mean i understand why you know to get behind the church you couldn't practice and i understand most of the leadership had to be initiated and most of the leadership is still being uh, uh, you know in that one of our great brothers was calvin butts you know yeah um he was on one of my brother lodges and the last award I got was given to me by Reverend Bust in his lodge. And he presented it himself and did this fantastic speech. And I said, Reverend Bust, you love me that much. He got like, <laughs> you know, we go back to before he was the minister of Abyssinia. Right. Um, when yeah, he, I, I remember. Yeah, I, can, I remember when he came in. Mm-hmm. So what 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 uh, what what does 2023 look like for you, James? What do you what well, what's so, in what's in the future? Besides you know, working with me in Ghana. Just, um, <laughs> well, my big thing is just working with my grandchildren. I got 23 grandkids and so wow. work with them. And then I have two children that I adopted in Ghana. One was a member of parliament for four years. And she said she wasn't going to run again. But I, from what I heard from her last week, I think she's going to run again. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my big thing is just to make sure these kids do well in school, especially the grandkids, understand the importance of an education. Um, and then down south, I'm working with my family in the south to consolidate our land down there and put it in a corporate structure so mm-hmm. no one can sell off the land. Mm-hmm. You can build there, but the house will have to be for perpetuity passed down through family. So we almost finished with that project. And then we have a commercial front. We have already contracted with a couple of businesses that will do the commercial fund, then that money would pay the tax on the land and take care of the people on the land, that sort of thing. So I'm working on that piece because I know at 77, I don't have a whole lot of time here. So I got to make sure <laughs> I do what mama and them wanted done while they were here mm-hmm. and get that done. And then in, in Africa, just step up 
the, the game and working with the different African communities. And we need to try to forge as much relationship as we can with the African Union. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the Congress that speaks for the entire continent and try to do as much influence around things, economics, political, and cultural as we can. So we do have an organization called the World African Diasporan Union, mm -hmm. which I'm its international vice president. I've laid back on it for the last few years, but I've kind of like escalated my involvement in the last year with that force. So we should talk about that. The other thing before I let you go, another, I, which is kind of exciting, uh, uh, Dr. J's nephew. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brother Hakeem Jeffries, which Hakeem is the nephew Jeffries. Of Leonard, Leonard Jeffries, this and his son brother Marlon Jeffries, uh, Dr. Jeffries' only brother, and um, he. This is a young man that his father and his uncle reared up together in terms of the male male part of the family. I remember when he went to Africa for the first time. My son Malik went to Africa mm -hmm. with him um, that summer. Um, so the, he was raised in the black movement, in the black community. You know, he was a corporate lawyer at the top of the corporate law chain before he ran for the state uh, Senate seat or assembly, the assembly and then for Congress. Um, smart young man, brilliant, really. If we can see the black caucus and the Latino caucus really supporting him in that position, and, and the white Democrats from who we helped to elect in many cases, <laughs> I think he will come out to be a very powerful leader, uh, both of the, the caucus, the Democratic caucus and the House, because he'll eventually be the Speaker of the House, the first mm -hmm. black speaker. We know they robbed Charlie of that. And so this will be the African vengeance. You didn't want Charlie? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna give you Jeffries, okay? Um, so, we, we knew they rob Adam of that, you know, um, and we've seen that history, you and I, we've worked with many of these men. Um, so now God has sent a much more radical young brother uh, <laughs> than the ones you pushed away. You know? Well, coming up with uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, as uh, I can imagine, as how we have come up knowing what we know, uh, from the brief encounters, it's interesting to see how that becomes part of the direction uh, mm -hmm. that is given as far as a lot of different things mm -hmm. that uh, you and I can listen to and say, that don't make sense. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to have somebody who can actually uh, articulate things with an understanding no matter what he's saying, we know what he knows. Right, right. <laughs> and he's a brilliant orator, if you've heard him. And, and he's, he, I call him a good political scientist. <laughs> Most people don't realize when, when, when Trump signed that bill that allowed many of our brothers' prison sentence to be reduced, a bill that reversed something that Biden and Clinton had done that did great damage to the black community, especially among black males. Um, it was Hakeem Jeffries who pushed that bill that Trump signed right. and got through to get those young people out of jail that shouldn't never have been in jail in the first place. So <laughs> he has the chutzpah, the courage yeah. to take on issues that other people won't take on, you know. And, and you know, he has an interesting crew, uh, which kind of scares some of those older Democrats. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, Republicans, but um, it's a change of time, you know. And and, uh, and he's learned to, how to work on this. Yeah. Just have to make sure that he's safe, because you know how that goes. Yes, you know? and 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 such meetings are going on right now to see. To <laughs> I know. Those. I'm I'm sure. I'm sure that they are, uh, mm. James, and. Uh, and please give the family, give Carol. How is she? Is she still practicing? She was calling me while we are on. She's practicing until June. <laughs> so I'm going to have to get up at this program and, and go give her that call until I'm on my way to pick her up. Well, please give her my regards. Uh, we were all in school together, you know, yes. uh, Carol, James, myself, and, and um, 
we've kind of been close for a long period of time. But James, I, I, I look forward to having some conversations with you uh, as it relates to the uh, Senegal. Senegal and, and yeah. especially Ghana, especially with the hotel in Ghana, maybe uh, that becomes uh, uh, an area that we try to, to, to work with as a base for the Harlem Tourism Board also. Yes, sir. We can uh, discuss it. Yeah. We're, we're looking so, to ways to ensure our longevity and expand ourselves, you know, there. So, you know, meditations, you know, sometimes it's funny because I usually meditate more when I have difficult issues before me, but sometimes it takes difficult issues to open up some other doors mm -hmm. <laughs> of understanding. And perhaps that's what our ancestors do. They know that I'm a knucklehead, so they <laughs> got to put stuff <laughs> before me that's so hard that I have to then take time and, and, and connect with them. So you No, know, you've been consistent, Brother Tony. Um, sometimes our politics used to bump head, but you have <laughs> yeah, been, that's how we you met. Have, you have been consistent in fighting for black people. You haven't stuttered. You're not. You didn't collaborate against your people. You didn't sell your people out. And I'm sure you had the opportunity. I'm sure they offered the money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I could have had a lot more money. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I, we both could have had because they offered me some, <laughs> they offered me some six figures, you know. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yes, well, that's true. Consistent. There was a lot of opportunities, but yeah. um, and, and, it will come. That's what uh, you know. Soon come. I I, I yeah. believe people that I'm talking to now. All things happen when they're supposed to, James. Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, the most important thing is that I've been able to keep my integrity. I can. If nothing, if tomorrow I'm not here, I, I truly believe that there are not many people can say that I did something that was not correct to them. No, I, I'm here to stand and speak for you. There's only a few people I can really speak for. You know, I know your work throughout your career, and I know how you stood for our people when other people didn't understand when you did what was called Black Black Pecan. <laughs> yeah, Black Africa promotion. Yeah, yeah. When people that didn't was, understand, people didn't understand what Black Africa was, right? <laughs> you know. So um, it's it's been an honor uh, being on the show again. It's an honor being with you. Um, keep doing your work. You know, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, is God's work. Um, many of our comrades have gone. Uh, for some reason, God has left us back here. You know, because <laughs> we haven't finished what He sent us to do. So we try to do that work um, best we can. And, when and uh, is, at some point in 2023, I would like for you and Dr. J to be on the show. We have to help him to do that. He was going to be on before, but uh, his guy who was supposed yeah, Brother to help Charles. him yeah, one call, of the in Africa, got so. caught in traffic. But yeah, but, but we'll we'll set it up. We'll, we'll set, set it up. up. And, uh, and we'll talk. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I will definitely call you actually before I, I leave for Senegal because there may be some things you okay. might need to help me with. Take care. Give Carol my okay, regards. Give the family my regards. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Smalls. Uh, we go back almost 50 years. That's hard to yeah. imagine, but, uh, but we still, we, you know, we still kind of can pass, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, take, my brother. Take Keep care, man. Blessing. Talk to you later. Again, that was uh, a, a good friend, James Smalls, who uh, I, I really don't know what allowed for me to, well, I do know. I, I believe this whole thing that I'm doing, uh, Awakening of the Sleeping Giant, is bigger than, than me, actually. Uh, I am definitely being guided, um, doing some things that a lot of people have not been able to do uh, as it relates to creating some, you know, very strong relationships that I believe can can base, uh, be a base for uh, awakening the sleeping giant, the African diaspora. I'd like to thank uh, Matt McCoy and Jasmine and everybody from Soul City for giving me uh, another platform to talk with. I'm not sure next week we'll be in Senegal, so uh, I have to see how the connectivity is, what's happening. If not, maybe we uh, may just play this again. I think this was a great show. So, so Matt, if I can't get anything done, maybe we can do a rerun. At any rate, um, 
thank you all uh, for supporting and listening. Uh, if I don't see you live next week, the following week, uh, we'll be on board. And we have a lot to talk about as well as some of the things that are coming up uh, for 2023, especially with the Holland Tourism Board. So again, thank you. Talk to you soon. Be safe. And um, I hope that we will see each other before the new year. Take care. Bye. This is Kia Rogers, and you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers, on WHCR 90.3 FM New York.